Hey everyone, welcome back to Introduction to Bifrost Visual Programming. In the previous tutorial, we created a stylized landscape using fields. Before we start, I'd like to answer a question that I got about how to animate the changing parameters of a field. Here's a quick demonstration of how it can be done. To access the frame count, we can use the node Time. Connect frame to frequency. If we play it, we see the changes in the noise pattern. We can adjust the values using Evaluate F curve. Say, set the frequency to be 0 0.3 for the first frame. and 1.5 for the last frame. Play it again, now we see the modified rate of change. We can also animate them using native Maya animation by exposing the parameters. Connect the frequency to the input, go back to the main graph, and connect it to the input node of the initial geometry. Then we can access the frequency from the channel box. Now we can set the frequencies for the first and last frames. That's how it works. Comment below if you have any question. Today we're going to learn how to create instances as a preparation for simulating fog and bonfires. We'll continue from the graph that we created in the last tutorial. The link to the file is in the description. First we need to locate where we want the visual effects to be. Then we scatter points in those regions. Create instances at those points and introduce variations. These will be used as source geometries for generating the fog and bonfires. Before we jump into the details, let's take a look at how the node scatter points works. Connect the mountain to geometry. And as we learned in the previous tutorials, we can use the node point scope together with the terminal to display the points. We can change the color mode to color so that it displays a uniform color. And we can adjust the size of the points. Right now the scatter mode is random. If we change it to blue noise, we see a more even distribution. We can also change the amount mode, for example, if we set it to radius, the value here means the spacing between any two points is at least two times this value. So a lower number means a higher density. We can also change the seed to get a different distribution of points. Each seed will create a unique distribution. If you want to learn more about scattering, there's a link in the description to the tutorial series created by Bifrost developer Jason Brown. There you'll find more in-depth explorations of scattering. At this moment, the points are scattered all over the mountain. But we only want the fog to be near the top and bonfires at the valley. To achieve that, we need to establish a relationship between the height and the density. On the scatter points node, we see this port density weights. This allows us to provide a weight for each mesh point of the input geometry. Let's get a value node. A weight of zero means that no points are generated nearby. A weight of one gives the normal amount of points. 
Any value in between generates fewer than normal number of points. Now let's get the y coordinate of each point of the mountain geometry, which reflects the height. First, we get all the point positions. And then we use vector 3 to scalar to decompose the vectors into their x, y, and z components. To restrain the scattering to the top region of the mountain, we want anywhere below a threshold to have a density weight of 0. And to remap the y values into a new range, we can use the node change range. Here the port value is where you plug in the values to be remapped. From start and from end are the bounds of the source range we choose. To start and to end are the bounds of the target range. For example, in this diagram, a series of numbers from negative 1 to 3.5 are mapped into a new range. The source range here is 0 to 2, which is mapped into a target range of 0 to 1.4. If clamp is set to false, then the numbers out of the source bounds are mapped using the same interpolation. If clamp is set to true, then the out of bounds numbers are clamped, meaning the one smaller than the lower bound of the source range will have the same value as the min of the target range, and the ones larger than the upper bound of the source range will have the same value as the max of the target range. Now let's connect the y values to value. For the source range, instead of randomly test different numbers to see which work for us, there are a few ways that can help increase the efficiency. The first method is to find out the range of these y values. In Bifrost, we can use a watch point to get the information of the output of a node. Hover your mouse over the wire, right click, and select Add Watch Point. Right now we don't see anything, because in Bifrost only graphs that are connected to an output or terminal will get executed. For example, if we do it here, we see all the information. To remove a watch point, simply right click and select Remove Watch Point. One way to get this one work is to get a set property node. Set the key to Diagnostic. Connect it to a terminal. And now we see the min and max of the y values. To make things easier in the future, we can create a compound out of these two nodes. Name it as, say, pool port. And if we right-click and publish this compound, then we can access it from the tab menu in any graph in the future. Here we see the highest point of the mountains is around 2. So let's set the bounds of the source range to be, say, 0.6 to 2. Set the target range to be from 0 to 1. Connect the result to density weights. Now we get points only around the top. To better visualize the density weights, we can use assigned diagnostic material, as we learned in the last tutorial. Connect the mountains to geometry, and the result from change range to emission color. Get a terminal. Let's change the background color for better view. Now we see the grayscale colors that correspond to the density weights. If we adjust the source range, we see the changes accordingly.
One problem about this method is that if we later decide to change the shape and height of the mountains, we have to come back here and adjust the bounds of the source range. This isn't the most efficient. An alternative way is to use the node array bounds to get the min and max of the y values. and use these at the bounds of the source range. This relieves us of any manual adjustment of the source range. And we can use an evaluate F curve to modify the distribution. For example, we can get a curve that filters out just the top. We can also add points to bring more complexity to the distribution. To reverse the values, simply select the second option from the preset curves. This allows us to filter out just the values. Through manipulating the shape of the curve, we can easily get different kinds of shape distributions and control how sharp the cutoff is. Another method is to come up with a formula, which allows us to use a ratio instead of an absolute value as the threshold. For example, as we just learned, we can use the node array bounds to get the min and max of these y values. If we subtract the min from the max, we get the total height of this landscape. By multiplying this with the percentage of our choice and adding it to the min value, we get the value for the lower bound of the source range. And we can use the max y value for the upper bound of the source range. This way we don't have to worry about any changes in the absolute height of the mountains. At first it may seem a little complicated to program, but through establishing parametric relationships, it facilitates future modifications. Now we have the points scattered at our desired locations. To place spheres at those locations as shown in this picture, we use the node create instances. Our instance geometry in this case is a sphere. So let's get a create mesh sphere. And set a radius. Connect the scattered points to points and the mesh sphere to instance geometries. Let's turn off the diagnostic view here. If we connect the instances to the output, we see the results. We can adjust the radius here. At this moment, all the spheres have the same size. To introduce variations to their sizes, we can use the node Randomize Point Scale. Set a range for the sizes, and now we have a more organic look with spheres of different sizes. If we want to use these instances as the source geometry for simulations, we need to convert them back to meshes. And the node for doing that is called Bake Instance Geometry. Plug in the instances and it returns a merged mesh. That's how we scatter points and create instances. Now let's create a compound out of all these nodes. And call it Create Instances Fog.
At this moment, if we want to say change the locations of the scatter or the size range of the spheres, we have to go inside the compound to adjust the parameters. To make things easier, we can connect a port where we plug in the parameter to the input here. This allows us to set the parameter from the outside. For example, we just connected the port of this ratio back to the input. Let's rename it as threshold. Now we can delete this value node. Go back to the main graph and we can set and adjust the number here. Similarly, we can connect the min and max of the point size range back to the input. As well as the amount of the points. Rename them. And now we can adjust all these values from here. Let's turn off the diagnostic view. To create instances for the bonfires, all we need to do is to copy and paste this compound. Rename it to create instances fire. Inside the compound, connect this value to from end instead of from start, and connect the min value to from start. Reverse the target range of this change range node. Go back to the main graph and connect the results to the output. We can adjust the threshold to confine them to the ground level. That's it for today. To recap, we used a combination of change range, scatter points, randomized point scale, and create instances to generate a customized cluster of mesh spheres. And we revisited some of the visualization methods such as point scope and assign diagnostic material. In the next tutorial, I'll start introducing the basics of simulations. Thanks for watching, stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.